here's a country that's been in constant conflict for years. But the more they fight, the wealthier they become. It's also a developed country that constantly ranks at the forefront in terms of high-tech and innovative enterprises. Yes, you're right. The country is Israel. You've probably heard about Israel's technological miracle. But what exactly led to the emergence of so many innovative enterprises in Israel and not somewhere else? Hey everyone, I'm Sheila Wang and if you want to keep up with the latest business and investment insights, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe my channel. Now, let's we dive into today's topic, Israel. Israel is Jewish nation, so most of people's first reaction is pretty obvious. Jewish people are known to be smart, innovative, and good at business. So it's no surprising we've got used to this vague explanation and overlooked the real reason behind it. The truth involves many factors, I think. It's not just about these genius stories. It's about deep-rooted culture foundations, suitable entrepreneurial enrollments and resources, as well as the influence of policies and capital. Personally, I don't believe that it's solely due to the genes of Jewish people that a nation excels in teamwork, cooperation, and innovation. Because we know that there are many other places in the world with outstanding talents, even more than Israel. Like students in Singapore, who always excel the natural science and the mathematics examinations. However, tech giants like Google, Microsoft, and Intel don't place their cooperation in those countries. Instead, they often rely on Israel, a country that consistently experiences war year-round. Why is that? To make it clear, we need to start with the upbringing of Israel people. While students in other countries are considering which university to go, but what are young Israelis doing? They're evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of various military units. Surprise, huh? Why? Because every 17-year-old boys and girls must report to the recruitment center and participate in the selection and closed training of the armed force. This includes positions like pilots, reconnaissance teams, naval commandos, infantry brigades, and more. In every mind of every young person, Israel's Ministry of Defense is like Harvard or Yale combined. In this country, a person's military experience is far more important than their academic background. During job interviews, one of the questions is always just like this. In which department of the military did you serve before? If you served in an elite defense department, you will be responsible for a team of over 10 people and equipment worth millions of dollars. Many times, you would have to take life or death decisions in a matter of seconds. If you served in elite technology units, you would be responsible for cutting-edge research and development projects. The knowledge and experience gained from these experiences surpass those of people who twice your age in the corporate world. The Defense Forces have a department specializing in technological innovation, while a normal service in Defense Force lasts 20 months. This department's training lasts a whopping 41 months. Everyone undergoes accelerated studies in mathematics or physics while also gaining knowledge about various branches of military. So that will be a huge proud for the young Israeli who can attend into this apartment. The technical demands ensure that students have a broad understanding of military knowledge, but the next step is continuous task assignments to develop them into problem-solving leaders. Their focus is on addressing specific military issues and finding interdisciplinary solutions. They cultivate military innovation, leadership, and problem-solving abilities, which become part of Israeli culture. 
Essentially, this training that combines leadership experience and technical knowledge, cultivating a new generation of entrepreneurs. And I believe that the enthusiasm for entrepreneurship among Israelis stems from not only a conscription system alone, which is far from enough to make Israel a nation of entrepreneurs. The more sophisticated approach is to create a cluster effect. In simple terms, Israelis are never short of entrepreneurs, partners and entrepreneurial resources in their surroundings. Israel has always had a culture without a hierarchical system in their perception. The only way to complete the task is by forming a team. Junior officers can address their superiors by name. If someone makes a mistake, you can openly reject the ideas and then everyone gathers to vote and make a decision. Even leaders, if they make a mistake, have to report the lessons they learned through a self-evaluation report, transforming arrows into an opportunity for personnel and team improvement. The long-term collaboration, task execution, and training relationships build another network. When they leave the military and want to start their own business, what they need to do is just make a phone call and uh, get more help from others. Everyone knows one or two entrepreneurs, whether they are family members, classmates, friends, who will provide assistance. We can find that the employment rate in the mainstream Israeli Jewish population aged 25 to 60. The employment rate for men and women are 48% and 75% respectively. While the Arab population has an employment rate of only 27% for men and 21% for women. Therefore, this entrepreneurial mindset is deeply ingrained in the hearts of young Israelis. Well, another point is that once they turn 20, most Israelis try to explore opportunities outside their country. By the age of 35, they have likely traveled to more than a dozen countries, which is why Israeli tech entrepreneurs have been patronating foreign markets. Traveling and experiencing different cultures broaden their horizons, opening their minds. So many advantages from this experience. So a significant reason for Israeli people's activity in emerging economies and on the fields is their frequent travels around the world, which also nurtures their curiosity and free-spirited nature. Yeah, there's another piece of history that we cannot ignore. When Israel was founded in 1948, they had a population of 806,000 people. But guess what? In the next 60 years, the population grew almost tenfold to reach 7.1 million. Wow, amazing, it's so quickly, right? Check this out. Out of every 10 Jews in Israel at that time, nine of them were immigrants. Yeah, these Jewish folks who didn't have a safe haven and were still wandering around on their journey. They needed help from immigration. The country provided them with a new home along with a sweet enrollment for work and study. But here's the thing, building a new economy requires more fresh businesses, right? And there wasn't much capital within Israel itself, my friend. So many staffs had to go abroad to raise funds. But hold up, think about it. It's a country that's been dealing with wars all the time. So who gonna put their money there? Plus, there wasn't any mechanisms in place to provide high risk financing for those staffs. So in 1980s, Israel was seriously lacking venture capital. But things changed, my dude. Europeans started dropping billions of euros to acquire Israeli companies. It became the norm, all thanks to the Yosma program that initiated by Israeli government. Finally, they realized the importance of venture capital. 
So when you follow me out here, you must be asking me, what is Yuzma program, right? Well, it worked if a partner could raise $60 million in investing. The government would pitch in $8 million to support them. And get this, after five years, if the project succeeded, the partners could buy bikes the government's shares at a discounted price. That means the government shared the risk and gave all profits to investors. For foreign investors, it was a rare money-making opportunity. And wait for it, the government even lent their money to invest. If the project failed, they didn't have to pay government back a penny. But if they made big bucks, they just had to pay back the initial investment plus interest. This had a huge impact on men. Many people started getting into this venture capital field. From 1992 to 1997, the Yosma Fund, with government support, raised over $200 million. Within five years, these funds were either sold or privatized, and the effect continues for over a decade. Listen up, my friend. Israel's got 45 domestic venture capital funds and 240 venture capital companies, all thanks to the Yosma program. It acted as a catalyst for Israel's tech boom, integrating it into the tech frenzy of the 1990s. It was an essential piece of the puzzle. It also had its limitations too. Apart from the tech startup companies and foreign investments, everything else was heavily regulated. A tech startup could find funding through various channels, but a traditional industry startup even if they just wanted a simple small loan, they face a ton of troubles. That's why before 2008, Israel's economic growth outpaced many other developed countries. But later on, it wasn't as ideal as before. The problem was the tech field was searching for work, but the standard of living and quality of public service wasn't that high. Other sectors didn't have a favorable environment for Israelis. So friend, here's the reason I've dug up. There might be a bunch of other factors in play. But just like farmers need good seeds, the right climate, soil, air, and proper care to get a good harvest, Israel's enterprise lies in innovation. So how can we benefit from their innovation? As I know, Singapore tried to adopt Israel's military conscription system, you know, the one that shaped their entrepreneurs' enrollment. But guess what? They didn't charge out a ton of stops like Israel did. Why? From my point of view, I think it's not just uh, about policies and capital men. It's about something deeper beneath the surface. It's about daring to merge different views fostering a team spirit that values both independence and collaboration, and breaking free from the chains of traditional culture, you know. And Israel's advantage isn't just about existing innovations, man. It's about their consistent evolution. Some folks are all about inventing and creating, while others know how to make the most of what's already been invented and created. The biggest challenge every country, every company, and even each one of us faces is not just generating ideas, but learning how to leverage the ideas others have produced. Lastly, there's a lot of things many countries and companies can learn from Israel. But hey, Israel also has plenty to learn from the world, my man. <laughs>